안녕하세요. 어, 반갑습니다. Welcome. 제가 오늘 영어로 하겠습니다. Uh, good morning. On behalf of uh, the Board of Directors of Korea Arts Foundation of America, I want to thank you all for coming to attend this press conference. Um, I also want to thank you, Director Jung, and the Korean Cultural Center for hosting this event with us. Uh, your long history of supporting our organization is greatly appreciated. Um, we are very pleased to announce that Kate Hurst Re has been selected as the 2022 CAFA awardee. I, we should probably. Um, I think you would also be interested to learn that she is actually the 18th recipient um, awardee. And CAFA was, I want to give you a just very brief history of CAFA. CAFA was founded in 1989. Uh, and it is the oldest, LA's oldest um, Korean American art nonprofit organization. Uh, our mission is to support creative endeavors, uh, encourage and nurture artistic accomplishments, and acknowledge the presence of outstanding Korean American artists um, working in the, not working, but in the United States and also internationally. Hence, the CAFA Award Program was established since the inception of the organization. Uh, we select one artist biennially for a $20,000 award, uh, and we also facilitate a solo exhibit. So in 2023, uh, Kate Hersree will have an exhibit at the Korean Cultural Gallery right down, down the hallway here, which will be organized uh, in conjunction by CAFA in conjunction with KCCLA. So hopefully you will all be interested in, in coming back to uh, report on that. So I'm very proud to share um, that Kate Hersry also joins a formidable cohort of past awardees, um, which include Doho Seo, Byron Kim, Suk Jin Jo, Yoon Hee Min, Won Ju Lim, Young Jun Kwak, Jennifer Moon, and so on. We have a, an incredible uh, cohort of artists that you're joining. So we're very proud to have you be one of them. Over the years, we've also had uh, and numerous respected curators, art critics, uh, serve as jurors. Uh, some of them include Bennett, Bennett Simpson of MoCA, Christine Y. Kim of Tate Modern, uh, Carol Eliel of LACMA, um, Alma Ruiz, um, and Elgood, and Lanka Tattersall of MoMA. So this year we had another amazing group of jurors. Um, they were Helen Molesworth, an independent writer and curator, Virginia Moon, who's actually present here. There she is, mm -hmm. associate curator of Korean art uh, at uh, LACMA, and Rebecca Rowley, associate curator of Mo MOCA. Um, um, I want to actually quote you, Virginia. Oh, <laughs> After a quite exciting deliberation on Zoom um, jury selection, they chose Kate, um, Kate Hurst Ree as this year's CAFA awardee, um, stating, I quote, Ree's trajectory as an artist has been propelled by a dedication to learning about and confronting the Korean culture from which she was separated as an adopted child. Her clever, thoughtful mixture of mediums in this endeavor definitely traffics in complexity and humor. They seem most impressed with Ree's work for, I quote, its sophisticated layering of motifs borrowed from historical Korean art with contemporary conceptual sensibilities. It is a rich and compelling admixture that we have no doubt will continue to expand in depth and in breadth. I think that. Now, without further delay, uh, it's time to invite Kate Hers um, to, for the, I think, present, presentation of the award. Uh, and then you will speak a little bit about your work and take some questions. And also, I want to remind you, we have some uh, lunch, I think, ready for you. So don't leave without taking your lunch. All right. Let's uh, uh, receive her with a round of applause again. So, should we like be here? Should we do? Okay. Yeah. Just for photo app. <laughs> here you go. Congratulations. Do it again. Do it again. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Can you get this up? Yeah. Face 
face off. Face off. Face off. Take your head off. There <laughs> you go. I'll exit. I must say, I feel very overwhelmed. I'm so honored to be here. Um, when I had gotten the call from Gloria Lee that I had won the award, I was thrilled. And I, I want to express, I think, what makes it so meaningful to me. I think as an adopted person, I'd been searching, you know, my whole life for, I'm getting, I'm getting really emotional, uh, for my roots and where I came from. And it's been, I think, the first time that I'd gone back to Korea. It's been so long, it's been over 20 years. And, you know, receiving this grant, having this uh, opportunity to really connect with uh, the community in Los Angeles where I had, you know, I'd done my, um, my master's at Irvine, so I had lived here is um, I can't express to you how much I, I feel uh, so grateful. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, what I think too, I, I could maybe talk a little bit about, I think where my work really took a turn was how excited I got to look at my personal history and how I could weave that into the history of the Korean nation and what it meant to be, you know, an adopted person in the 1970s being sent, um, what I think is a bit like a forced, mi a forced immigration or forced migration to this country, but, but how much I felt empowered by knowing um, how that happened, why it happened, what different geopolitical uh, kind of powers were at play at that time. And as I started to delve into more Korean culture and the specifically, you know, the, the artifacts and the artworks that were made through um, Korean history, that's when I started to find my voice, I think. And so I'm really excited about the work that I'm starting to produce that's really looking at not only, I would say, the, the type of work um, from like the I'm looking at like 15th to um, 19th century from you know Western Europe all the way to Chosun, you know, Korea, and the type of transnational cultural exchanges that were happening at that time. That's I think when my work started to really flourish when I started linking my own personal history to this type of you know these cultural exchanges that had happened for you know the last you know more than 500 years. So. Um, I'm sure you have a lot of questions for me, but I also, you know, want to also say my, before I, we begin the questions, I also want to just um, express my, my deep um, gratefulness to the juror, juries, the juror, I mean, I'm sorry, the jury, um, Rebecca Lurie and Helen Molesworth, and of course, Virginia Moon. And I think, I think Virginia could really, uh, with her background history in Korean, uh, art history, she could really understand the types of things that I was really trying out, the experimental ways and strategies that I was looking at, like, you know, Korean aesthetics, but also the type of, you know, transracial, transnational, transcultural uh, kind of platform that I'm trying to bring, you know, through, through my work. One thing also I could also say that I think might be interesting is, you know, I identify myself as a social practice artist, and I think for some people, they might not know exactly what that means. What does it mean to be a social practice artist? Uh, being a social practice artist for me is is really uh, looking at, you know, things like that are happening currently in our society. It's it's looking at social justice. It's looking at you know issues surrounding um, inequality and using art and using art practice um, to go deeper, you know, with the research and also to make a, a kind of way to link that to the current events that are happening in order to really promote change. And so maybe that's a, a way for us to also frame the types of works that I'm doing, uh, even if the work is a sculpture piece or it's a drawing or if it's an installation, it, it really tries to activate, you know, society for positive change. Can I say something? <coughs> Stay there. 
What you said made me think of something. Sure. Stay here. Oh, yeah. Okay. yeah, yeah. Hi, my name is Virginia Moon. I'm the Associate Korean Art Curator at LACMA. I was part of the jury in selecting Caters Re for this year's uh, recipient, Kafa recipient. And in listening to her talk, I was reminded once again of what I had thought about her work. Um, there's no doubt, I have to kind of say it to her, I'm kind of saying it to you. There's no doubt in my mind that uh, your work is deeply personal. And I think that we see a lot of artists, sure, they draw from themselves, um, and therefore it is personal. But what I appreciate that you work so hard to do is to articulate what that is, to articulate your own exploration and really research in search of deeper understanding. And I think as a result, your work is capable of reaching others who might not be able to articulate it themselves. So thank you. Thank you so much. You can also ask the question in Korean if you ask it slowly because I, I can understand some things. Yeah. I will say that I've studied Korean for such a long time <laughs> and I still have not really reached the type of fluency that I would prefer to have at this time. But I recognize it's like this, it's a lifelong journey. It's not something that's going to happen overnight. And I've given myself less pressure to be perfect. And um, it's been a real joy actually to bring that knowledge into the work that I'm doing. So if I, I've tried to um, play with the ways in which I, I learn it so that it becomes more fun. Because it was not fun when I learned it like 25 years ago. <laughs> I have a question. I imagine um, when you weren't sure, were sure to start this journey. Um, I imagine there are a lot of points where you must have felt discouraged. You must have wondered what am I trying to do and how do I want to do it. Can you talk to us a little bit about that, if you don't mind? It started quite early. I mean, in terms of, I would talk about my, my kind of constant ish, uh, interest in the Korean culture. I think I was probably in high school. And I didn't grow up in um, a place like Minnesota where there were a lot of other adopted Koreans. It was a place where I think I was like the only one I knew besides my sister who's also adopted. And so there was no handbook. You know, we were, I, I think I was adopted in maybe the second wave. And there was no, there were, weren't really avenues for us to do Korean cultural camps or, you know, go to have Korean language. And so it was really discouraging. And so when I first returned, um, the first time I returned to South Korea was in 1997. And I was very young. I was still a teenager. Um, it, I didn't know anyone besides some students that I had become quite close with. I was, uh, I was very interested always in Korean traditional music and dance. And so I joined this Pungmul group. I wanted to learn Korean drumming and I was very active at the University of Chicago with a group for about two years and they gave me a lot of encouragement and support to search for my roots. And so I had won a, a kind of scholarship to go back and um, that was my first time. And I must say, it was a very, it was a very traumatizing event. I think that the Korean nation had never expected us to return. 
and we had been sort of swept away, like disappeared, the disappeared generation of children. So when we came back, people were not sure of how to greet us, not sure how to receive us. And I think because of the collective shame, we weren't always treated um, with respect and we weren't always welcomed back to Korea because there was this kind of constant questioning of, of what our identity was. And so I went through a lot of, um, I would say I was depressed uh, during this time, but despite all of that, despite all of these trial and error with you know trying to learn the language and the culture, I still had felt so much, um, how can I say, like, maybe kinship or uh, a desire to to find a kind of place because I think that's what I always had felt like that I didn't quite belong or fit into where I had grown up and through my work I think I was able to find a way because maybe in some ways like when you're when you make work even though it is quite personal it's still, I can have a distance to it as a creator. So I saw it as sort of my fodder for, you know, making something that then would trans be transformed into another um, medium. I, I don't know if I would, I wouldn't necessarily, necessarily say that it was like therapy, but I would say that there were certain points where it became very therapeutic and empowering. I have a follow-up question to that. You know, a lot of artists um, on their path, whichever path they have chosen, there are moments that take their path in a different direction, or they, f they go along and at some point they feel like, okay, I've, I've done as much as I could. Mm -hmm. I've answered my question, and now I'm going to do something different. So in your case, I'm wondering, where do you think you are in this path? And do you feel like you've gotten closer to understand what you're looking for? Mm -hmm. I think I came to that point, actually. Let me share this story. I was in graduate school at Irvine. And I was really moving away, I think, at this point. I think that because I was living in California, in especially in Southern California, it wasn't bizarre or strange or abnormal to be Asian. Uh, Korean community, the Korean community was very strong. I had tons of Korean American friends. I had tons of Asian American friends. So it wasn't really this pressing, urgent issue to define myself as, you know, a Korean American. It just seemed like it was normalized, you know? And I started moving away from that. And I, what I think I started really examining or exploring uh, quite intuitively was really the culture of my adoptive family. Meaning, you know, I had grown up in a German American family. Granted, they're like fourth generation, <laughs> They don't speak German, but I'd always kind of grown up thinking that I should have been connected to them, to that German sort of ancestry in some ways. So I went to Germany. I finished my MFA and I had a grant and I went there thinking I would just stay for a couple years. And I, I've now been there for over 12 years. And I was really um, passionate about learning about this culture I speak fluent German. It was a lot easier to learn than Korean. It came so easily to me because I'm not a German person. You know, I don't have this type of pressure or mind block or feeling that like people are expecting me to comport myself in a certain way. So I didn't have all this stress of daily life. And so I learned quite quickly. I mean, I must have learned the language pretty fluently in about three years. And it's funny though, because you know, I met my partner, and my partner is actually half German and half Korean. <laughs> and then, you know, he's the one that t 
taught me how to make kimchi. He's the one that, you know, taught me so many different things about the food culture. And then it was through his family who, um, who, were, who are very, very active in the Korean German community that I started coming back to Korea. I mean, in a way that I felt really embraced and I could get away from a lot of the, maybe the emotional baggage that I had with being Asian American. Um, and I could reinvent myself. Like I could be in some ways like who I wanted to be. And, and nobody questioned, you know, my Korean heritage. Um, they did question my American heritage, which is another story, but I, I think I felt more liberated to, to make the type of work um, without the sort of idea of, of my identity. And so I moved away, and then I came back. And it was yeah. actually through German culture and language that I came back to being Korean. But when you come back, it's stronger, isn't it? I was more critical. Yeah. I was um, ba more aware of, I guess, um, the cultural landscape. Mm -hmm. And I certainly knew much more about Korean history. I think that that also really helped. Because there were lots of missing links. And mm -hmm. you know, I knew a lot about um, Korean adoption history, but I didn't know, I didn't really know about Gwangju. Um, I didn't really know about, um, I mean, that's like very modern Korean history, but I didn't know about, you know, ancient Korean history. Mm -hmm. um, I had never read a lot of the, um, the books that people had been talking about, you know, when I was, I think the book that came out when I was in Korea was the Korea's Place in the Sun mm -hmm. by Bruce Cummings. And then I, I sat out and I read all those books. Mm -hmm. And so I think doing that in a third culture brought on like a different level of maybe responsibility and also freedom. So I know that as, a, oh sorry, she has a, one question. Well, of course. Yeah. Uh, what kind of messages do you want to deliver to Korean community through your artwork? I think, like specifically like the Los Angeles community or just like the Korean diaspora community or the well, community well, in Korea. Well, I think those messages are all, can be all, different and it's like my identity in a sense. I think that identity is really fluid. Identity is something that's always in relationship to something else. And the ways, you know, the work that I make, I'm, I'm very interested in site-specific work as well. So using um, symbolism and using the medium to communicate uh, to, in a, in a very efficient and poetic way to the audience that will be there at that time in that exhibition. So it ends up actually changing quite a bit depending on where I'm showing my work. Uh, are you uh, working on any uh, new and exciting projects and anything you can share with us? I'm very excited. Of course, I'm very excited about this award and being able to continue the uh, the research that I'm doing and then be able to show the results in that exhibition next year. But I have an artist in residence at the, it's called the Museum for Asiatische Kunst, which means in English, the Asian Art Museum, which is part of the Humboldt Forum in Berlin. So I'll be working there for three months. I also have a, a, a grant that I received to um, install a new work in that space while I'm having the residency. And then I will continue the project that I'm working on that's really about looking at the history of um, object collection and object display um, from a perspective, a very transnational feminist perspective. I mean, one thing that I like to say about my work is that, you know, we say that it's very biographical, but I like to call it actually auto-ethnographic. And I'm bringing in also not necessarily like an activist or an only very activist point, but there is kind of a call to action, I think, that I, I always try to have, you know, underlying the work so that, you know, people can take something from it and then think about how they can improve their lives, um, how they can think about maybe um, how we can change society actually for the better. And so part of that in Berlin is specifically looking at the history of collecting of these, these institutions that are really grappling with this idea of, you know, colonial pasts, 
um, who these objects belong to, um, who, what, what, you know, what is authentic identity in terms of, you know, these these pieces, um, who who gets to speak for the objects, and that's what I'm going to be doing in the next um, couple of months. No, he has stars. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 